Good morning. When you all get quiet, I take that as my cue that we ought to begin. <clears throat> so uh, welcome to this time of worship. And uh, we have been uh, we've been working through celebrating the Sundays of Advent. Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and the Sundays of Advent are the Sunday of hope, the Sunday of love, the Sunday of joy, and today the Sunday of peace, the peace of Christ. Uh, just a couple of things before we begin. Uh, first of all, we're having a little computer difficulty, so uh, the hymns will not be on the screen this morning, but you have them all printed in the bulletin. So, um, and also, uh, Jeff asked me to tell you that uh, the second hymn we're going to sing today, the one right after the prayer of confession, uh, this is a new one to me. I think it'll probably be a new one to you too, although it's a familiar tune. Uh, but Jeff asked me to pass along to you that uh, this hymn text was written by Martin Luther. Uh, Luther loved Christmas, and he celebrated Christmas uh, with a great deal of gusto and joy. Um, he wrote some of his best uh, sermons. Uh, some of his best sermons are Christmas sermons. Uh, and uh, he wrote this particular hymn text for Christmas. So that's the, the, the hymn right after the uh, prayer of confession this morning. Let's begin our worship as we celebrate today and honor the promise of peace that Jesus Christ brings into the world. I'm going to begin with a familiar text from Isaiah chapter 9, beginning with verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's stand together to praise God. We praise you, our Lord, this morning that you have brought us peace. We ask that your peace would reign over us as we worship this morning. Through the love of Jesus, we ask that you would infuse our hearts with gratitude. Through the power of your spirit, may you unleash in us powerful praise for all your worth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Join me in the prayer of confession that's printed in your bulletin, and then a moment of silent personal confession. Let's pray together. God, our Father, Father, we we spend spend much time time troubled and and conflicted, but but you are forever at perfect peace. Your plans cause you no fear or anxiety. Your power knows no limits, and your loving goodness no boundaries. Though we should trust you and be at peace, we are prone to anger and conflict because we cannot make other people bend to our will. We make promises to you we cannot keep and fall into despair and bitterness when we fail. Father, forgive us and give us peace in our weakness. Help us to accept our complete dependence on your grace given to to us through your Son, who laid aside his glory and was born as one of us, that we might know your peace. Amen. Hear this word from the Lord from Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. In Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Uh, Dear friends, believe the good news of the gospel that through Jesus Christ, we are at peace with God. Uh, And one day, his peace will cover all creation. Amen. This morning, Peter and Susan are going to do our Advent reading and light the candles of the Advent wreath. Today we light three candles to remind us of God's hope, love, and joy. We'll light a fourth candle to remind us of the everlasting peace that comes from a right relationship with God. Our relationship with a good creator God was destroyed and, and we turned away from God and put ourselves on a throne so that we might be higher than God. The lack of a right relationship with God 
means that we're separated from peace with God. Long before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah said that a Savior would come to us, and he would be the Prince of Peace. Jesus came to earth to pay the price to restore a right relationship for us with God. Jesus now offers us the gift of forgiveness and eternal peace and a right relationship with God. Please bow with us in prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us the ultimate gift, the gift of sending Jesus, the Prince of Peace, to pay for our wrongdoings and the brokenness that we've caused. Thank you for forgiving us and for a restored right relationship with you. Teach us to reflect the light of Jesus into our dark world, that others might know your forgiveness and peace of a right relationship with you. Amen. Thank you, Peter and Susan. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, lead us in prayer and, uh, as always, uh, give you an opportunity in the prayer to speak aloud to people th that you're concerned about, that you want to lift up to the Lord in prayer. Uh, and uh, just a couple of things to be aware of. Uh, first of all, uh, Linda, who we've been praying for, for her broken hip, is back in the hospital. Um, she has, uh, so she's doing all right, and hopefully we'll get to come home tomorrow. I uh, had a problem with some blood clots, and uh, so let's keep praying for Linda. Um, from among EPC sister congregations in southwest Idaho, we're going to pray today for the Evangelical Valley Presbyterian Church in Hazleton. Their pastor is Jim Day. And uh, to close our prayer, I will lead us into the Lord's Prayer. Let's bow together. Mighty Father, we give all thanks and praise to you that we thank you and praise you for the wonder beyond our comprehension that in your great love for this broken world and in, in, in your love for rebellious and sinful people that we had all turned our backs on you, you humbled yourself and took on human flesh, sent your son into this world as one of us that he stepped down from the eternal glory of heaven and became vulnerable, became a human baby. And we thank you, O oh God, uh, as we celebrate the birth of our Savior, we thank you that he didn't remain a baby, but he grew to manhood to show us who you are, to teach us your way. And to offer himself as the perfect sacrifice for sin on the cross. And through the power of that perfect sacrifice, oh God, you've called us to yourself and you've made us new. Uh, it was you, oh God, who brought us together in this church. It's you who have placed a bond of peace between us. First, first of all, you've You've given us peace with you through Jesus Christ. And you've given us a bond of peace with one another. Uh, Lord, that we don't need uh, to constantly be defending our rights and guarding against one another and mistrusting each other. But you have placed between us a bond of love and peace in Christ. We pray that you would grow that bond in our fellowship we pray it for uh, believers all over the world. Uh, you've not called any of us, uh, Lord, to, to be alone in this uh, journey with you, but to walk with others. And uh, that's why you established your church. And so we pray, uh, strengthen your church, bless your church, pour out the gift of peace on your church that we can model for the world a, a different way, a better way 
your way. Father, we pray uh, for peace in our nation today uh, as we are conflicted and uh, there is still remaining uh, conflict uh, surrounding the election. Lord, we pray. Uh, we pray for our nation today. We lift up uh, President Trump as he continues to serve. We lift up Joe Biden as he prepares to, to assume office. And Lord, uh, we pray that you would guide and lead. Father, we pray uh, for once again for uh, those who make decisions about our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, Lord, uh, uh, I want to lift up especially uh, those who make decisions in uh, local, local health departments and especially for us, uh, the, the people responsible at Central District Health. Uh, Lord, they're at a center of swirling controversy and under tremendous pressure. And, uh, so, Lord, uh, protect them and guide them, we pray. Father, we lift up to you all who are sick or hurting today, and we want to especially pray for Linda and uh, pray, Lord, uh, complete healing from these uh, blood clots as you continue to uh, heal her hip. We pray fresh strength for her and that she'll be able to come home soon. Lord, we pray uh, for our brothers and sisters in Christ at the Evangelical Valley Presbyterian Church over in Hazleton. We thank you uh, for their fellowship, for their witness. And we thank you for each member of that church. Pray that they will be a powerful light for you in that community. Thank you for their pastor, Jim Day, and we pray your blessing on him and leading for him. And Lord, there are many people in our hearts we would bring to you today, and we speak their names to you right now. Go ahead and speak their name aloud. And now let's offer together the prayer that our Savior gave us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now watch me shout. <laughs> My name is Allie Eames, and today's Old Testament lesson is Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 7. I will be reading from the English Standard Version. Let us pray. O oh God of glory, we praise you and thank you for your holy word. May we listen with open hearts and find the wisdom and compassion you desire us to have. Help us witness to our love in everything we do. We pray in the holy name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Hear the word of God. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. 
I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. The word of the Lord. Please stand to sing. Please be seated. The New Testament reading uh, is Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 8 to 14. But uh, first of all, uh, a couple of things to be aware of. Uh, Number one, please remember uh, that you need to register if you want to attend Christmas Eve service. Uh, We will have two services. There will be one at 5 p.m. and one at 6.30 p.m. Christmas Eve. And just as we do on Sunday morning, uh, we need to spread out uh, and limit the number. Uh, we, We should be able to accommodate everyone who wants to come, but you do need to register. So uh, if you're on uh, the mailing, uh, if you're on the email uh, list, uh, you got that email with the button to click so that you can register. Um, Hope, love, joy, and peace. And today, 
the Sunday of peace, and I'm going to read the really familiar words of Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. Hear now the word of God. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Would you bow with me? Oh God, Jesus said your word is truth. So we pray now, open up our hearts and our lives. Write your word within us so that we would be transformed to be more like Jesus, your living word, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, at, at Christmas... We sing about peace on earth, but uh, peace on earth seems to be in short supply (laughs) right now. Uh, And our country uh, right now seems to be more marked by conflict than by peace. Uh, We're still conflicted over an election and uh, a whole lot of people uh, wondering uh, if they can trust the result. We're conflicted over matters of race and equality and justice. Uh, Just this past summer, we saw violence uh, in our cities like we haven't seen. uh, Well, in in many years, uh, some of us remember, well, maybe, maybe most of us in this room remember the 1960s. We're conflicted over the COVID-19 pandemic and how we should respond to it. Uh, just a few days ago, and that's the, re- the reason I prayed for the leaders of Central District Health, just a few days ago I saw a picture in the news of a protest outside the home of someone who is a decision maker with Central District Health, and some of the protesters were carrying firearms. Now, conflict is a normal, normal part of human life. There has always been conflict. There always will be conflict. And by the way, uh, whenever you complain about politics, remind yourself that politics is what we do instead of shooting one another. <laughs> Thank God for politics. There's always been conflict, there always will be conflict. Put two people in a room for more than 20 minutes (laughs) and they'll find something to disagree about. Uh, The the Jews, by the way, have a saying, two people, three arguments. (laughs) But conflict becomes dangerous when we get angry And one of the reasons we get angry, uh, and the psychologists and therapists will tell you this, one of the chief reasons we get angry is because we cannot get others to bend to our will. And then we begin to think that, well, if I raise the volume, I'll be more persuasive. And then, 
in our anger, we may begin to think other people need to be forced to bend to my will. <clears throat> Imagine, if you will, uh, and even though it's beyond our imagination, let's try the, the almighty power of God the omnipotent power of the creator of the universe who spoke the universe into being. Vast beyond what we can imagine, he set every star in place, every galaxy in place. The power of God is beyond our imagining, beyond our description. If anyone could have forced his will, it would have been God. And he didn't. He came into the world as a helpless, vulnerable infant. Now ask yourself this, is there anything, is there any creature on the planet more helpless and vulnerable than a human infant? Uh, even a baby gazelle is up and running with the herd in about two days. Not a baby human. He came into the world as an infant, born to a family that was far from home. They used a manger an animal's feed box for a crib because they had nothing else. And yet, today, billions of people all over this globe call him Lord. Apparently, apparently there's an unexpected power in the weakness of God. You know, that's what the Apostle Paul said, 1 Corinthians. The foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God stronger than human strength. Uh, you might call it manger power. Uh, the great 16th century reformer Martin Luther, and I was telling you earlier, Luther loved Christmas and he preached some of his best sermons. Are, and, and by the way, there's a really good uh, uh, book. It's It's kind of a magazine style book. It's still in print uh, from a, a Luther scholar who's in heaven now. His name was Roland Bainton and it's called Luther's, Martin Luther's Christmas Book. I really recommend it. Uh, and it's, it's filled uh, with his uh, Martin Luther's Christmas sermons. Luther uh, referred, he called the power that is displayed in the manger, in the birth of Jesus, and then also even more fully in his cross. Luther called that the left-handed power of God. That God works, as it were, with his left hand, his weaker hand. There's a kind of power that does not coerce, does not try to control us, from the outside or impose its will. This power seeks to reach inside of us and transform us from within. Um, and, and there are human examples of left-handed power. Uh, let, me, let me give you just one. Imagine a young dad, oh, I, I, can, I can look back there in the back of the room and there's a young dad holding his infant. What a coincidence. And you know what? Uh, I'm sorry, to, sorry to make you an illustration, Preston, but it's too late now. <laughs> how, how, much, how much stronger is Preston than that little girl? And she's got him wrapped around her little finger. <laughs> That's left-handed power. 
right-handed power is the power of this world. It's the power of armies and navies, of police forces and government. Now, I, I want to make very clear, there is a place for right-handed power. Um, the great George Orwell once said, we sleep safe in our beds because rough men stand ready in the night to visit violence on those who would do us harm. And I'm thankful for those rough men. And, 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 and there's some rough women too these days, by the way. The Bible agrees that in this sin-broken world, there's a place for right-handed power. Uh, just read Romans 13. Uh, it talks about the authority of government and what Paul calls the power of the sword. Uh, that, that rightful authority uh, has, has what Paul calls the power of the sword to subdue evil, to subdue wrongdoing. Uh, I would not live in a town that didn't have a good police force. And uh, while I'm on the subject, I'll just also throw in here, I think I would have to think for a long time I'd have to really work at it before I came up with a worse idea than defund the police. Now, that's, that, that's just a side comment. I should step out of the pulpit when I make those kinds of comments. But um, <clears throat> there's a rightful place for right-handed power. Uh, God's word says so. But... But there is inherent weakness in right-handed power. Uh, and w once again, I, make clear, I, I want to make clear, I, th I thank God for the armed forces of the United States and for those who serve and have served. But there is an inherent weakness in right-handed power. Actually, there's two. Number one... Right-handed power can always, always be defeated by a superior right-handed power. And that's been proven true throughout history. Uh, one nation may be on top of the world for a while, but it doesn't endure. Right-handed power can always be defeated by a superior right-handed power. And second and more important, Right-handed power cannot transform the human heart. Cannot change hearts. Cannot take out a heart of stone and give anybody a new heart, a heart of flesh. Right-handed power can force submission, but it cannot transform. And in fact, when it forces submission, it only creates a simmering hatred and resentment. But there's nothing in the world stronger than the left-handed power of God. Remember what Paul said. The weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The left-handed power of God is the power of the manger. It's the power of the cross. It's the power of the gospel. The good news about Jesus Christ that transforms hearts, that makes people new, that reconciles people to God, that reconciles people to one another. I want, I want you to notice something with me. Uh, think about, uh, and I actually didn't read it this morning, but think about it, but I know you know it. Remember the opening of the second chapter of Luke. Uh, where it says, in the days of Caesar Augustus, when Quirinius was governor, of C was governor of Syria, right? If you read that opening of the second chapter of Luke, you'll notice that names are in descending order of right-handed power. First comes Caesar. He was top of the food chain in the ancient world. Uh, he was head of the greatest empire the world had ever known. 
one step below him, Luke mentions Quirinius, uh, governor of, of Syria, a, a Roman official, uh, next on the totem pole in that area. Next in Luke's order comes uh, Joseph. And he's only a peasant carpenter, but he's head of his household. And so he's in the food chain above his wife, Mary. And then last, Luke mentions the child in the manger. Now think for a moment about how Jesus Christ has turned that pecking order on its head. The rest of the New Testament is the story about how Jesus humbled himself all the way to the cross. And he laid down his life there for sinners. He said the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus turned the pecking order upside down. He rose from the grave and now he's exalted over all. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. And one step below him is his mother Mary. Now we Protestants don't venerate Mary, but the angel Gabriel himself said all generations will call you blessed. And we do too. And then next below her, Quiet Joseph in his supporting role. And last of all, dust bunnies in the waste basket of history, Quirinius and Caesar. The only reason that you and I know who Quirinius is is because he's a footnote in the story of Jesus. And Caesar, well, uh, I once heard a pastor say, Today, we call our daughters Mary and our dogs Caesar. God showed his left-handed power in choosing a young woman named Mary. And in a patriarchal time and in a culture where right-handed power was always held by men, think Caesar, Quirinius, Herod, God said, I'm going to show you so-called men of power how important you are. I'm going to call a young peasant girl on whom none of you has laid a finger. And together she and I are going to bring into this world a savior who will redeem the world from the greed and hatred and conflict that holds this world captive. The incarnation, the most important event in world history took place And no man had anything to do with it. It reminds us that God is on the side of the underdog. Uh, I'm reminded of a a story that I heard about a widow lady. And uh, her only daughter was about to get married. And the widow uh, didn't have much money, but she scrimped and she saved and she spent all of her savings to buy the most beautiful and elegant dress that she had ever owned in her whole life. And she brought it home. And then a few days later, she was horrified to learn that the mother of the groom had purchased the identical dress. The groom's family was very wealthy. And the widow talked to her daughter, who talked to her fiancé, who then talked to his mom. And she said, I'm wearing that dress. I had it. It looks good on me. I deserve it. I'm wearing that dress. Well, word got back to the widow. And she went back to the store and bought a very plain and simple and affordable dress that she would wear to the wedding. And somebody said to her, but you're giving up so much and you're you're still going to have that beautiful, expensive dress 
and it's just going to hang in your closet. And she said, no, it won't. I'm wearing it to the rehearsal dinner. <laughs> God was smiling on that rehearsal dinner. Because God is on the side of the underdog. In her famous poem, The Magnificat, Mary said, God has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Jesus came into the world in left-handed power. And he lived his life as the servant of all and he gave up his life on the cross to give us peace with God. Not forced with right-handed power, but inviting us to bend the knee to our Savior. Colossians 1, 19 and 20 says, In Christ... All the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now, now why would God put himself in such a position? Why would the Son of God lay down his life for rebels like us? Why would he put himself in the position of pleading for the love of people like us, pleading for us to come to him in faith? God is God. God can do anything. God can make anyone do anything except love him. Love, genuine love, cannot be coerced. It cannot be forced. If it's forced, it's not love, is it? And knowing that we would resist and run from a holy God, God, you might say, snuck up on us. A baby in a manger. A man on a cross. An empty tomb. This is how God made peace with us when we were hostile to him. We were hostile to God. Apart from Christ, we're not indifferent to God. We are hostile to him. We are rebels. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, we are not ignorant people who need a little bit more information about God. We are rebels who need to lay down our arms. Remember what the angels said? A multitude of the heavenly host joined in and said, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace. Now a whole lot of people, a whole lot of Christmas cards stop right there. Uh, And that's not the gospel. And that's not the fullness of what the angels said. Uh, and uh, frankly, I've, I've heard some lazy preachers who stop right there. And maybe I've been one of them. But I'm not going to stop there today. On earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. It's not a big wet blanket of peace over all the world. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. With who is God, with whom is God pleased? With any who will come. With any who will come to the Prince of Peace and bend the knee and receive him as Savior and Lord and allow him to cleanse away our sin and reconcile us to God. Give us peace with God by the blood of his cross. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, for I am meek and lowly of heart. 
meekness is not weakness. It's power under control. Come to him. Trust in him. And when we trust in him, the way of the Christian is the way of the manger, the way of the cross. Jesus said, you take up your cross. What does that mean? That our way in the world is to be not to be the way of right-handed power. Nobody was ever coerced into salvation. But the way of the power of the love of God in the cross of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came in to the world in a way we, when we see that baby in the manger, we don't put up our defenses, but we drop our guard. And when we see you on the cross, we know that we can't defend ourselves against such a powerful love. You've conquered our hearts, Lord Jesus, with left-handed power. Father, we pray that our peace with you would grow, our knowledge of you would grow, uh, and show us how to be people of left-handed power in this world, the power of service and love, the power of the cross. And we pray it in the strong name of Jesus, the Lord of all. Amen. Now I invite you to join me as we affirm our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's printed in your bulletin. Please stand as you are able. Church, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
if you have brought an offering this morning, uh, Sharon is somewhere. Oh, there she is right over here. She has a basket. And uh, Sharon, why don't you just bring it right up and put it on the, put it on the table. And uh, when, when we're done, you don't need to now, but if you brought an offering, just bring it up and put it in the basket. And uh, go now in peace, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you now and abide with you evermore. Amen.